and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You are invited to hear the good news of Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. The message translation. Don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? you? Trust me. There's plenty of room for you in my Father's home. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so that you can live where I live. And you already know the road I'm taking. Thomas said, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? Jesus said, I am the road, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. Philip said, Master, show us the Father, then we'll be content. You've been with me all this time, Philip, and still you don't understand. To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. Believe me, I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see, these works. The person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, but even greater things, because I, on my way to the Father, am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. From now on, whatever you request along the lines of who I am and what I am doing, I'll do it. That's how the Father will be seen for who He is in the Son. I mean it. Whatever you request in this way, I'll do. Something bought. Got it. 
and I wrestled that thing in at age six, and it was a great northern pike. The problem is, it was too small. We had to throw it back. I would not catch another one of those fish until I was 32. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. By the time I had turned 32, I had kind of stopped fishing. You see, when I was younger and I was pulling at nothing, I got bored with it. I said, well, this is, this is fruitless, this is pointless, I'm just not going to do it. And so occasionally I would walk out to the end of the dock at this place and throw out a line, but basically I just gave up. And I stopped fishing. And so when I was 32, and my brother and I went out early one morning, I mean really early, we were really gung ho about it, I caught lots of fish for the first time. But I still had a problem. I still didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and my brother and I were like, it was, it was a complete joke trying to figure out what to do with the fish. Because we would try to pull them in, and he would knock them off. The biggest fish we caught, obviously, was the one that got away. <laughs> and because um, he would just hit it with the net. And go, no, Jeff, you have to scoop it up. So we kept, we didn't know how to fish. So even when we were actually able to catch the fish, we still couldn't pull the things in. So here we are, him, you know, graduate of law school, me, you know, going to seminary, we're all like really educated, we can't pull in a fish up the boat, because we've lost the discipline. There was an art to the entire thing of fishing. Anybody can take a hook and stick it in the water. It takes a special person who wants to bait the hook with the right kind of bait for what you're after, know what distance it needs to be from the bottom of the ground. It takes somebody who knows how to pull the fish up in just a way so it doesn't come off the hook. There, I, there is one thing about this. My grandfather hates barbed hooks, so all of the barbs, all the, all the lures and hooks we were using had no barbs. So the fish could get away very easily. But nonetheless, my grandfather could still catch fish this way. And that's the thing. My brother and I had stopped fishing. My grandfather never had. And there's a fundamental reason for this difference. My grandfather had started fishing in the 1930s. And he had started fishing because they needed food. Fishing for him was not a sport. Fishing for him was how you got food. He grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. He walked out to the dock and he went fishing for the evening meal for he and his eight siblings. Now his father still had a job through the entire depression, but it was still hard. Eight siblings, eight children, anybody knows that's a lot of children. And so he, as a young boy, the second youngest, went out and went fishing. And that's how they fed. For my brother and I, there was always food in the pantry. It was never a discipline. And that's the idea here. When Jesus talks to his disciples, the difference between what they're hearing and what he's sharing is that what he's telling them is that to follow me is a discipline. It's a way of life. It's something that's ne it's a necessity. You need to kind of keep up with it. You have to be a part of it. You have to learn it. It needs to inhabit you. For the disciples, however, Jesus is a guy who performs miracles. And they think that that's pretty cool. So they follow him around and they get to see more miracles. It's like a fan show. And it's the difference between being something and just receiving something. It's the difference between just kind of saying, well, yeah, okay, this is really cool, so I'm going to pay attention to it, but instead, living it. Jesus was telling his disciples, you can't just arrive at where you want to go. You have to learn how to do this. And so when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he's responding to that question from Philip, Master, or no, from Thomas, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? The whole thing that Jesus has been doing up to this point is teaching them how to journey through life. And what he's teaching them is a radically different way to journey through life. And so his response here, and John's Gospel is always about trying to help us understand what Jesus meant 
when he's talking. It's a very cryptic way, and people remember this line, I am the way, the truth, the life. That's the way we've probably heard it most of our lives. And here it's translated, it's that way, it's the same Greek word as road. I am the road, I am the truth, I am the life. What does he mean by that? Well, the first is that road. That road is that discipline. That road is, okay, I'm going to travel and I'm going to live in the way that Jesus is teaching me. What does that mean? We'll get to that in a second. I am the truth. Now, this statement has been used to the embarrassment of Christianity for many, many years. Because we go and we say, Jesus is the truth, and if you reject the truth, then you're completely lost and you have no idea where you're going. Forget it. Well, in 1896, Leo Tolstoy wrote a book called The Kingdom of God is Within You. And what he was writing about was this idea that God's kingdom was a nonviolent way of living in the world, of developing practices of resisting, of non-resistance to violence that would stop the cycles of violence that governments and economies were built on. He wrote it within the tottering Russian Empire, and for him this was really bad. The book was banned, of course. <laughs> they didn't like it. And so it was only practiced, uh, circulated around Europe. But somebody picked up a copy of this book in South Africa, somebody else who was in exile, and that man's name was Mahatma Gandhi. When he picked that book up in 1896, he read through it, and he wrote to Tolstoy, and he said, what an amazing book. Now that's paraphrase, I'm quite sure that's not what he said. <laughs> what an amazing book. But, he said, you know though, it's too idealistic. This whole non-resistance to violence thing, this whole kingdom of God is within you, it's not possible. And what Gandhi did say, and I'm paraphrasing this, but he did use these words, his truth was the British parliamentary system. And he felt that he could change India through the British parliamentary system. And that was his truth. That was the truth in which he operated. So he looked at Tolstoy's book, and he said, okay, Jesus is the truth, this nonviolent way of living. That's the truth of the world, but that's idealistic. We can't do it. My truth is the British parliamentary system. I can achieve peace. I can achieve independence for India using the system that's already in place. And so he goes out, and he tries doing this. By 1906, he gave up. By 1906, he realized that that system was endemically based on violence. And as movements and protests, as ideas and hopes were quashed in violence suppression, he realized that the only way to do this was to operate within the British parliamentary system of gaining his own violence, being able to get stronger than the other in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, so becoming more powerful, or breaking that cycle of violence altogether and becoming nonviolent to the point where the people who were, who were doing the violence would feel so ashamed, would feel so embarrassed, would be so transformed that they would stop because it doesn't make sense. Not immediately, and not without pain, and not without hurt, but it would happen. That was the truth that he moved towards. And he moved that through this saying that Jesus makes that was reinterpreted by Leo Tolstoy and brought to Gandhi's attention. He developed the way. He found a truth. The truth. And that led to what? Life. In the world in which we're often living, we fear, or we feel, that we have a way, and we've got a truth that we operate by, but do we actually feel alive within it? How often in your own daily living do you feel like this is just kind of a deathly life? That you're not actually awakened to the potentials, the possibilities of living? How often do we open up the newspaper? And we look at violence happening in whatever name we might think it needs to happen all over the world. Does that violence affirm life or does it affirm death? And often it's justifiable. 
Look at what's going on in Nigeria. Trying to rescue the 276 girls, some of whose names you still have from last week, and some of whose names remain here on this table, sharing our witness together today. Armies are lining up. People are dying over this. Jesus is advocating a different truth, and that leads to a life for all, an abundant life. But again, it's too idealistic. It sounds too good to be true. It's like, well, that's great, Jesus. That's a wonderful idea, but really, we can't do it. It's not possible in our world. We know how our world works. We know what happens. If you do this, this happens. That's what it is. There's entire doctorates of political science dedicated to this. I know I study political science. <laughs> and we develop that sense of balance. And we think, well, that's just how the world is, so we're just going to mitigate it. We're just going to mitigate the violence. And that's, that's good enough, right? And Jesus is saying, no, that's not good enough. You have to live this way. And it's not going to be easy. But they really don't want to hear this. So, and, and he says something else, too. He says, if you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. Now, this is a radical statement. This is an extraordinary statement. Because for them, God was something that you've never seen. God is unseeable, unknowable. God is, is, is completely out there. Yesterday, um, Irish and I started watching Simon Shaman's documentary, The Story of the Jews, uh, which you can watch on PBS online. They've got the, the whole series up there at the moment. And one of the excavations is of the earliest portable devotional boxes to the God that we worship today. And these were boxes, ornately carved on the outside, but unlike idol worship that had been done before, nothing was on the inside. It was a recognition that God is undefinable. God wasn't in the box, but it was a thinking that God can only be contemplated by something that we can't comprehend. God inhabits even that space. The archaeologists, they, uh, the archaeologists called them God boxes. But Perhaps there's another way to think of it. God is something that we can't comprehend. And yet here's Jesus saying, you can see the Father in your midst. If you've seen what I'm doing, if you've seen me acting in this way, you've seen God. That's huge. And the other thing he's doing too is he's mitigating against that system, that governmental system in there when he uses the word Father. In 3 BCE, so just after Jesus' birth, because we got the calendar wrong when we set that zero date. Um, but in 3 BCE, the Roman emperor was named Pater Patriae, the father of the fatherland. When the word father was used in the empire that Jesus was living in, it was referring to the Roman emperor. It was referring to the man-god that was in charge of the entire empire. The father of the fatherland. Here he is using that same language, but he's referring to a totally different system. A system where the father, the god, the whatever it is, is not way out there in Rome with his armies and his might and his violence, but is amongst you. Is right there with you, living in this nonviolent way when you love when you serve one another, when you wash one another's feet, when you open yourselves up, the God is amongst you. This is a totally different state. But they don't want to hear it. The disciples don't want that to be, they want it to be easier. They want it to be direct. They want it to be clean. They want it to be you know, handed to them. So Philip says, Master, show us the Father. Then we'll be content. Jesus has just said, the Father, you've seen the Father. And he says, well, I don't remember what it looks like, so can you, can you show them to me? Because I've kind of forgotten. My mind's a little bit fuzzy. And Jesus pushes that. You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand. This is why I use this translation. It's fantastic. Because it shows Jesus getting a little bit ruffled up, uh, ruffled up about this. If you can't believe that, or no, let's see. 
Where is the Father? Don't, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Don't you believe that how I'm acting, how I'm living, how I'm loving, how I'm serving, don't you believe that that is God? Don't you believe that yet? That's what he's saying. This is a totally different way to live in the world. And it frightens the disciples. And it probably would frighten us. But think about that fishing story again. For my grandfather, you had to fish. For me, I don't have to. And the interesting thing now is that my grandfather, even at 93, and he can still beat me at golf, <laughs> has stopped fishing. Because he doesn't need to fish anymore. Because he doesn't need to take the fish out of the water, out of their environment. He says, I don't need to do that anymore. He gave my brother and I a real guilt trip. And we came back, just like this poor fish. Because we didn't know how to clean the fish, and we had to ask our 91-year-old grandfather how to clean the fish. We hadn't learned the discipline. We hadn't learned what it means. So what did the disciples wind up doing? They wound up founding churches. They wound up founding communities where the way could be lived together. And the earliest Christians called themselves the followers of the way. They went to churches where they could learn how to keep that discipline up because it was too essential. It wasn't just a, oh, I like this. It wasn't just entertainment because guess what happens with entertainment? It grows old. You don't care anymore. If you don't pick up enough fish, you say, well, that's fine. I don't need to do that anymore. If you don't win in a video game, you just put it away after a while. If you don't, enjoy watching football anymore, you just kind of stop watching it. But faith is a religio, that Latin word for religion, a way of life. It comes into your core. It inhabits you. And that's where the church should be. A church is where we find that way to evoke and awaken that presence of God amongst us, to encourage and nurture and nourish us so that we have the ability and the strength to go out and live in that radically different way. Because it's not easy. The journey is long, and if nobody's walking with you, you're going to stop. Lone Rangers always fail. We need one another. We need that community. And that is how we awaken God in our presence. And then we say, and you know it. You know those moments in your life where you're, you're like, I have seen God. It was Mary Magdalene who said, I have seen the risen Lord. We see those things. And it breaks into our world and it awakens us up. And people, it changes things. So that's what we do here. That's what we're called to do. And if we're not doing it, then we need to change something. And if you know we're not doing it, help us change it. Amen. Um,